What do the Sedevacantists have right? And why should we listen to them? Two things I think are particularly important. First, that the Pope is not above tradition, and therefore the Church needs to return to the pre-55 liturgy. And secondly, the new right for the consecration of bishops introduced in 1968 is disastrous. I'm referring here specifically to Sedevacantists like Father Anthony Cicada, may he rest in peace, who concluded that there has been no Pope since Pius XII, and the new bishop's consecration right is invalid. Because most Catholics find these conclusions unthinkable, there's a temptation to write off the Sedevacantists to refuse to listen to their reasoning. I think this is a mistake. Even if we don't go so far as to say there's no Pope, their arguments that the Pope didn't have authority to change the liturgy, as they have, is very important. And even if one doesn't accept this argument of authority, at least one can see the changes that have been made are catastrophic. In any case, there are certain truths which we can believe with absolute certainty. The Blessed Trinity, the Incarnation, the Real Presence, and also that Jesus himself instituted the papacy and the church hierarchy. But as to the question of who is the reigning pope, history shows that even saints can disagree on this. And if the hierarchy has crippled itself with the 1968 consecration rites, this can be fixed. If we face up to this fault, admit it, then we can return to God and the church will be herself again. So to the first point that the Pope is not greater than tradition, during the reign of Pope Pius XII, the church committed grievous self-harm through papal acts of unfaithfulness, which in themselves threatened the very life of the church. But we know God is our helper. There were attacks on the sources of revelation, both scripture and tradition. And what are the consequences? Look at this Lilo Mass. The priest involved has admitted to being imprudent. This is not imprudent. This is an outrageous sacrilege. I don't know the qualities of the man, but it's clear that his formators have not taught him what the priesthood is and what Holy Mass is. One could argue that it's the Novus Ordo that makes such things not only possible, but inevitable. In fact, the seeds for this go back further to the changes made to Holy Week by Pius XII in 1951 and 1955. For example, there was an introduction of tables into the sanctuary on Palm Sunday and the Easter Vigil. So this priest thinks he does not need an altar, that there needn't be relics underneath it. This introduction of a table for the blessing of palms and the blessing of the Easter waters has resulted everywhere to an aversion to altars. And this was done partly in order to face the people not understanding that God is the priority of the liturgy. Then there was the introduction of the vernacular at the Easter Vigil. So this priest does not understand the reading and gospel are offered first of all to God and offered for the living and the dead, not primarily for his little crowd on the beach. What about vestments? Given the discontinuing of the folded chasuble and the broad stole on Good Friday, which go back to the very earliest centuries, why is it not possible to discontinue all of the vestments and offer Mass in a swimsuit. Then traditionally, on Holy Thursday and Good Friday with the stripping of the altars, the crucifix and the six candles were left in place. It was understood that the altar should not be separated, not only from the tabernacle, but from the crucifix and candles. They belonged together. But the 55 rite had the candles and crucifix removed at the stripping of the altars. It seems like a small change, but it should be unthinkable for a priest to offer Mass without them. And one of the most harmful changes in 1955 was the separation of the Last Supper from the Crucifixion in the four readings of the Passion through Holy Week. So that modern Catholics think that Mass is primarily a meal, not a sacrifice. They don't realize they're at Calvary. If one understood one is at the foot of the cross, then it would be unthinkable to involve a lilo and swimsuits. Now Father Cicada and the priests with him put everything on the line for the sake of the pre-55 liturgy. And in this, I think the whole church should acknowledge they were absolutely right. Because once you allow those changes, everything will fall apart. And what about the scriptures? Pope Pius XII, under the influence of Cardinal Bay, began favoring the Masoretic text, that is the Hebrew Bible, in preference to the Vulgate and the Septuagint. 
there was an excitement among theologians and exegetes as if they could go back to an earlier, truer source for the scriptures. The method for discerning God's revelation was no longer through piety and humble prayer, but through scholarship, as if intellectual industry can find the true meaning of Holy Scripture rather than humble petition, as if we can force God to reveal himself. Timothy Flanders, in his book, The Introduction to the Holy Bible for Traditional Catholics, has given a very good account of this. To give an example of the problem, this book by Etienne Barr, he's a Messianic Jew, so we don't agree with all his beliefs, but he shows how Psalm 21, verse 17, was changed in the Masoretic. We know Jesus prayed this on the cross, saying, they have dug into my hands and my feet. This is the nails boring into his body. But the Masoretic text, whether by accident or deliberately, has changed a letter in that psalm from avav to a yod. It seems like a tiny change, but the translation becomes, instead of, they have dug my hand and my feet, like a lion are my hands and my feet. Nobody knows what that means, but it certainly obscures the truth of the crucifixion. Timothy Flanders shows how the idea of an in fact non-existent original text has allowed theologians to argue for a new interpretation of the scriptures contrary to that which has always been accepted by the church. And the extreme consequence of this is that today there are many who argue homosexual activity is not condemned in the Bible, which is to turn the scriptures completely on their head. What about the 1968 consecration rite for bishops? The reason for the changes was to downplay the role of the bishop as one who sanctifies and instead make the claim that his chief work for God is as a governor, a king, a ruler. This was explained by one of those responsible for the changes to the right, the Belgian Benedictine Bernard Bott. He wrote that the bishop is the ruler of the church, hence the choice of the term hegemonikos is understandable. It is the gift of the spirit apt for a leader. Now this is true of a bishop, but it is not the principal part of his identity. So Paul VI, after praising the traditional rite of consecration and the truth of doctrine which the rites and prayers contained, then said it ought to be expressed, it seems, in a better and more accurate way. What arrogance to think he knows better than immemorial tradition. He said, for the better attainment of this end, it has been judged opportune to take from the ancient sources the prayer of consecration, which is still preserved in great part in the liturgy of ordination of the Copts and of the Western Syrians. There are so many problems here. Apart from many doubts since raised about the source, the Maronite or Western Syriac rite, which by the way involves a 370 word preface, is for the installation of a patriarch. It is not for the consecration of a bishop, because the patriarch is already a bishop. And the Coptic rite he references has a 340 word preface, and this is replaced by Paul VI with a selection of 212 words of which he designated just 42 as the essential form. Here is the old form and the 68 form. The latter asks for the governing spirit, that's the hegemonikos, hegemony. Now this governing spirit can be the Holy Spirit, as the rest of the prayer indicates, but it is not clear. And worse, we know there were Freemasons working in the Curia, Annibale Bugnini working on the liturgy, and Sebastiano Cardinal Baggio, Another Freemason was prefect of the Congregation of Bishops from 1973 to 84. What would his intention be when he was the principal consecrator of dozens of bishops? What does he understand by the governing spirit? Why? So Paul VI's assurance that these prefaces used by Copts and Syrians is empty. It's just 42 words which the consecrating bishops say out of over 300. Why even raise the question of whether the right words have been retained? Why bring this confusion into the church? What makes this so incredible is that just 21 years before, in 1947, Pope Pius XII had declared infallibly the form and matter for the sacrament of holy orders. He taught that the form, and the only form, is words which univocally signify the sacramental effects, namely the power of order and the grace of the Holy Spirit. He specified exactly what words constitute the form of the sacrament. Now the problem with the new rite is not only have they changed these words, but whether or not they univocally signify the Holy Spirit, which you could argue, they certainly do not name the power of order. Therefore, Paul VI has acted against the infallible teaching of a previous pope. 
Now it's said truly that popes can't bind their successors, but this doesn't apply to faith and morals or to scripture and tradition, which are givens. In the liturgy, a pope can adjust the rubrics. He can make a cull of the calendar. He can approve texts of new feasts, but not these barbaric changes to the pontificale, which are as disastrous as the changes made to the missal. Father Cicada has made very detailed arguments why this whole rite is problematic and he would say invalid. Other theologians and priests have also made detailed responses arguing that it is valid. However, these agree they're not trying to defend the new rite of consecration as a whole, which is certainly deficient in failing to convey the fullness of graces which a bishop requires. You know, a bishop has the hardest job in the world. Not just the demonic attacks on him in the spiritual sphere, but the huge charge of responsibility given to his care as pastor of a diocese. So many souls to look after, so many doctrines to defend and explain, so many calls on his time. How can any man on earth do this in a holy manner if he's not first equipped with all the possible graces which for 2,000 years the church has meant him to have? These defenses of the 68 consecration rite, which say it is at least valid, do not in fact demonstrate that. It's difficult for priests to be objective on this subject, because if the bishop's consecrations are invalid, then most of us are not priests, and that's hard to face. But none of the analyses I've seen, although perhaps there's some out there, actually produce the original prefaces from the Syriac or Coptic rites in the original language, giving a translation and then showing what Paul VI selected from it and what he omitted and what was denoted as the form. But in any case, how can it be right to extract the sacramental form from one rite and inject it into another? Even if this new rite is somehow valid, it cannot be pleasing to God. Moreover, when Pius XII defined explicitly the form and matter of holy orders in Sacramentum Ordinis, he followed this by immediately saying, It shall be in no way right to understand from what we have declared and ordained above as to matter and form, that it would be lawful to neglect in any way or to omit other established rites of the Roman pontifical. Indeed, we ever command that all the prescribed details of that Roman pontifical be religiously observed and carried out. In fact, it's been thrown out. Again, I don't know whether the facts take us so far as to say the orders are invalid, but it is a fact that the changes are a weakening of the graces given to the bishop, a misdirection of his work, degrading the ministry of sanctifying to make way for an exaltation of power. No wonder we have worldly bishops seeing as the whole rite was rewritten with this very purpose. God gives us what we ask for. It's time to stop thinking validity is enough. We owe God the best we can do. And in fact, the church can't survive without that. There are numerous problems with the 68 rite for the consecration of bishops. There are no problems with the traditional pontificale. It is a crime against God and the church to have changed this. A deliberate rejection of grace and a turning to the world. An enemy has done this. Is there a solution to these problems? Of course there is. We should return to the pre-1955 liturgy and recognize that nobody has the authority to prevent a priest from offering this form and understand that the papacy is bound by tradition. The Pope cannot serve the church except by guarding this, teaching this and passing it on. There should be a happy return to the Vulgate as the authentic scripture and the priority of the Septuagint over the Masoretic. A clear sign of this will be to return to the traditional numbering for the Psalms, and a return to the ancient rite for the consecration of bishops. If it's deemed necessary for validity, then validly ordained Eastern rite bishops can be there consecrating to get the Latin rite church back on track. Now perhaps you feel powerless to achieve these ends, but there's no grounds for panic or despair. Every one of us can move mountains by prayer, with faith and persistence. God only asks us to do what we can do, and we can all learn to love the scriptures and love tradition. As an example of how tradition can strengthen and inspire us, for the calendar in use in 1955, today, the 18th of August, includes a commemoration of Saint Agapetus, and the ninth reading in Matins tells us about his martyrdom. He was a 15-year-old under the reign of Emperor Aurelian at the end of the 3rd century and for his faith the judge took him and had him scourged 
and then thrown into a prison for four days where he had no food or drink. And then he was brought out and burning coals were put on his head, for which he gave thanks to God. And then he was beaten again and naked, suspended by his feet over the fire so that the fumes and, and smoke went into his mouth. He was taken down and boiling water poured over his stomach and then his jaws were broken. Now at this point, the judge ordering these tortures, he fell off his chair and died. The emperor was furious and he ordered young Agapitus to be thrown to the beasts, but the animals did not dare to touch him. And finally he was killed with a sword. Now, if a 15 year old can show so much constancy and good cheer in the face of all those tortures, which we can hardly think about, then let's not complain about our situation today. God is with his saints and with his church. Nothing will overcome the church. We need to return to tradition and scripture. and We will see the King of Kings prevail across the whole face of the world. God bless you all.